So this is a case study of, of a project, um, kind of an ongoing project. Um, and when we began it, um, we didn't even know about uh, Laura Wan. Um, uh, we just knew what we wanted to do, which is to monitor the uh, exposure that children were getting when they were being wheeled along the street. Um, initially, we were thinking about uh, you know, a dirty London street, but uh, since then we've realized there are all manner of different ways of monitoring dirty London streets, but very few ways of monitoring any other street. So we're kind of more interested now in in, in uh, provincial streets. Um, so this is kind of the mission uh, to give people uh, actual exposure information where they are. Um, using measurement uh, rather than modeling based on very limited and, and uh, dispersed data. We wanted to also to adapt it very much for pedestrian use to provide a simple visualization that anybody could understand. Uh, obviously, we're handling uh, people's data, therefore we have to be compliant. Uh, and in the end, what we want to do is to both drive awareness of where pollution is, is heading uh, and how it's improving or not, and, uh, and help people to make behavior changes that will protect them. Um, of course, there are lots of, of ifs and buts. And if this was interactive, people might be asking uh, these three questions and many more. Uh, is there really a market for something that does measurement because you know, you're getting into expensive sensors if you do that? Um, when will they really be cost effective and when will the, the overall cost of the device be low enough to, to make this useful for a business? Um, and you can uh, you add questions like, and when will we bother to open source it? Um, all those things uh, we felt uh, would have you know, can be dealt with later, uh, but they're not to forget that they're important. Okay, so when we first started doing it, um, we got a little bit of funding to make some prototypes, so we did, uh, but the funding was very restricted. So we used off the shelf um, components, uh, a laser cut case, and uh, we used um, communication to the cloud using GSM via a connected phone, connected by uh, Bluetooth Low Energy. So, you know, that was a solution, and we ended up with a system like this. Um, so there's, uh, oh, you can't see my pointer, can you? Hang on, I'm gonna turn it on. Pointer, there we are. Um, so we're, we're basically collecting the data, sending it to a phone, which in turn is sending it to a storage platform um, and uh, thereby to a website. Um, so uh, then we can get you know things like this, that, and uh, this is a, was really a, a, a triumph of uh, when you get a lot of people together with different skills, uh, they can either make it pretty or make it <laughs> practical. This was the pretty version. Um, later on we had to make it practical otherwise we'd have a complete solution um, initial feedback from the first trial we did were, were the obvious things um, but being too large and heavy and inconvenient um, and they especially talked about charging batteries pairing the device to the phone uh, were reasons why they just didn't take it out that often um, and we're, therefore we didn't get enough data to make it useful. So we thought, okay, well, that was a great learning experience. What we need to do now is make a, a single box um, much smaller. Uh, we'd need to use custom PCBs to do that. We couldn't use any off the shelf components. And then we need to integrate the comms so we didn't have to, the, the uh, end user didn't have to worry about that. Um, we looked at the idea of GSM, but then, you know, there were SIM cards and all kinds of stuff to do. Uh, we looked at MBIOC, but just not rolled out. Um, it's another of these um, communication systems which uses a similar technology to LoRa, but um, 
it in the future would be quite attractive if it was adopted by a lot of um, of uh, normal communications companies. Um, but right now it's very partial. Um, so Laura kind of was the winner um, in that it enabled us with a small amount of, of board area, small amount of power uh, to um, produce a solution. So we did a, a, a trial with that. Um, actually, I should have changed the slide, but it, uh, we were using a previous LoRa network called Things Connect um, on that first trial. Uh, we're not using that anymore. We now, now we use the Things Network, which is what Mike was just talking about. Um, and what that means is that the this connection to the to a smartphone is not necessary. In fact, the whole smartphone isn't necessary. Um, if you uh, collect the data, send it over to the storage platform, and then access it with a website on a tablet or browser, you get the the data you want, um, which is the one that shows uh, what the uh, amount of pollution was along the route you're going down. Um, so. A uh, quick LoRa trial result um, based on the old hardware was that LoRa was working really quite well as long as you were near to gateways, say you were near within a mile of a gateway. Um, but of course, the gateways are very sparse, um, so we had to deal with that. Um, and of course, the packaging, uh, as I showed, you know, that packaging at the beginning, I mean, needed complete rethink because there was no way that was going to. Uh, be compact enough or light enough. So what we did then was to develop the custom boards. Um, we made um, a, a new case uh, with a bit of room in it for an additional sensor um, because the, the previous one, we just had NO2 and CO, there's a um, uh, couple of useful things to measure, uh, but with PM, uh, now we're really measuring the the, the pollution properly, um, and we installed a gateway for each trial. So on a school, if we're doing a trial at a school, we put the gateway on the school roof, and looked at some antenna options, both internal, which is now our preference, or external ones, which, uh, well, uh, that's a longer story, but we didn't work so well. Um, Initially, we had a two board set, and the idea was that we'd have one board with all the stuff that we would definitely want, and then another board which we could change the chip used for communication if we decided to upgrade to a different kind of communication. Um, and you'll see we have GPS on there because getting location um, is uh, something which on LoRa right now is not well understood. Uh, so for the moment, uh, we would continue to use a conventional GPS chip. Um, so uh, actually, that was a full start because what we did, and this is a bit stupid, really. We should, you know, have been doing this stuff for a number of years now. We ought to know better. But we put the battery and charger circuit on the board uh, with the sensors uh, and the A to D. And uh, that turned out to be unmitigated disaster. <laughs> so um, we uh, now do not do that. Um, now we have in the, the, the latest um, iteration, uh, the sensors and A to D are on a completely separate board, uh, which has only got an I squared C interface to the main system and then uh, the battery and charger uh, and all the extra serial connections we needed um, were uh, were then on um, a, a separate board. And just by having that board separate, um, we kind of we cured the problem that had existed on the first board set. So there's a new board set. Um, this is an example of uh, well, one less than the latest, but it's uh, good enough to show you. Um, so there's uh, the processor where we're using a, a BLE cap capable processor still because we want we want to have that BLE capability. Um, that underneath there is um, a microchip 
uh, device, which is the um, RN2743, not the latest, but but a um, certainly good for the purpose intended and a, a GPS chip. But on the bottom, we've got uh, extra serial ports and the charger, which is actually on the other side of that board, and uh, the sensors. There we've got um, two um, chemical-based sensors fitted, and on the, uh, the next iteration of the board, it, it, it will have three. Um, so it, the casing that we've been able to put it in, you can see now is considerably smaller and much lighter. Um, and within that casing, we've got the measurement for, as I said, nitrogen dioxide, uh, 2.5 uh, PM uh, particulate matter, um, carbon monoxide, which is just kind of for a reference point. It's not really part of the solution and the ability to do an ozone sensor, which um, uh, it seems that weather like this is something you need. Um, and it's a, a nightly charge system, still very much aimed at parents with children, but you can use this uh, on in cycling. You can use it in doing surveys, which are useful for councils and planners. And uh, a very environmental campaigners want to get their hands on it, but um, I haven't got enough units to lend them any, and they haven't got any money to buy them. So uh, that's where we are with that. Um, this is um, about my uh, my daughter pushing her grand uh, my grandson, and oh, what's happened to my my? Oh, there it is. No, it isn't. My pointer has disappeared. Uh, I wanted to show you where the ah, there we are. Where the uh, devices uh, strapped on with uh, double-sided Velcro, which we found works really well, and it works on just about any uh, pram you like. Um, and so the idea that the gateways are installed on a school roof, um, so that gives a good range of all the people in the nearby area who are walking to school, uh, and uh, they take the device back and forth, and um, preferably strapped to the push chair and preferably at the height of the um, child's nose and so that uh, gets you the most uh, realistic measurement um, but you can carry it in other ways if you want to. Um, now this is uh, slightly obscured by that but this is a snapshot of some trial runs we did when the pollution was actually quite low. It's using the DEFRA scale so a green that color of green means a pretty low level uh, of pollution. Um, and uh, that was where we were for this latest trial, just before an inconvenient thing happened, which is the school was shut down. So uh, we can't uh, continue with that trial for the moment. But um, I think we, you know, we're reasonably confident now that we can do uh, what it was that we set out to do. Um, and then depending on the feedback from that, we'll decide to take it to the next stage. Um, it's some of the ideas we've got for the future, things like eliminating the charging cable. It's, it's just the one remaining nuisance when you bring the thing into the house after using it. Uh, you really want to just drop it down. You don't want to have to plug it in and then have uh, communications options, um, speed up the provisioning process uh, and make it more secure, of course. Uh, uh, and I'll be, I shall be speaking to uh, Cyber Gibbons about that. In fact, we've already exchanged a, a mail because I don't really want to do a roll your own. Um, I prefer to have something which uh, is going to be widely recognized as, as secure. Um, and we'll be simplifying the internal connections and making a hard plastic case with improved weatherproofing. Um, yeah, that's it. Um, so uh, any questions you have um, are probably, well, we've got some time now probably, but if you really want a proper answer, uh, uh, tweet me to that uh, 
address or at least send me an email and uh, I'll get back to you. Great. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, we do have some time for some questions. Um, again, as ever, raise your hand in GoToWebinar or ask a question in GoToWebinar, or you can use Twitter at PCSOSG or at Paul underscore Tanner. Uh, I've got a question here in GoToWebinar uh, from Andy Bennett. Um, how do you find the Laura Wan coverage to be? Okay, well, that's one reason why I showed you this. I didn't tell you what the scale was, um, but that's but top to bottom of the map there um, is about a mile and a half. Um, so uh, what I'm finding is that pretty much within a mile, you will get coverage, um, even though uh, the terrain around where I'm doing the testing at the moment, which is actually going to near where I live, the um, the terrain is quite it's quite hilly, um, but the um, antenna is positioned reasonably high on the school roof, and uh, and we're getting you know coverage over the area we want. So um, I think you know if you had a, a coverage area that you needed to be say four miles square, uh, then I think you would need to put put up several uh, gateways. Thanks, Paul. Uh, I've got another question here from Abhay's Indurua. Uh, Paul, what is the cost per unit? Well, at the moment, these are quite expensive because um, they are effectively handmade. Even though there are custom boards, um, you're putting this thing together by hand. Um, so uh, a couple of hundred quid at the moment is what they cost. But, um, you know, that's a moving feast, really, for two reasons. One is because uh, if we get uh, some really good trial results, then we'll move to another stage where we'll make the assembly more automated. And um, and secondly, because components, uh, some of the components anyway, are coming down in cost. So, uh, yeah, I think in terms of, say, a bomb cost of a couple of hundred quid at the moment. So, you know, to put that on the market if you wanted to do it the way it is now you'd probably be wanting to charge uh 600 or something but uh you know over time i think this will come down to a sensible level maybe we can uh I, you know i think get it make it cost less than the cheapest iphone uh, that should be about right significant power power um yeah because it's got a particulate sensor in it um, particulate sensors have to move air through a chamber so they have a type of fan it's a, it's a very for a fan it's very low powered but nevertheless um uh while it, while that's running it is consuming um hundreds of milliamps, which means that on a battery that we have, the kind of battery we have in there right now is, is, is about a, an amp hour. So um, this lasts uh, a day, you know, you can use it for a hard use, a whole day in hard use or in light use, which is the normal mode uh, for the kind of application we have here, then uh, you're very safely, uh, if you charge it nightly, you've got plenty of power to spare. Um, but yeah, that is that is one of the issues, of course, that we've been working with and one of the reasons why uh, the, I, I mean, I won't go into the details of the electronics, but, but just suffice it to say that if anything can be switched off, it is. <laughs> uh, and uh, most of the time, if it's on standby, it's consuming almost nothing. Great, thank you, Paul. Uh, any further questions for Paul? Uh, I think that might be it. So now I'll pass back to Andy for the final wrap up. Thank you, Paul. Welcome.
So um, thank you, thank you very much for coming along this evening and and, and um, kind of bearing with us whilst we did our very first online online meeting. Here are the um, the dates of future meetings that we're going to be having. Um, the one on the 11th of June, I've just been told, is actually now on Wednesday the 10th of June. Um, so we'll send out publicity for that in the in the usual way. Um, please do send me feedback about how you found the session tonight. We're we're very keen to iterate it and get it into a really good format. I know the no the social side was almost non-existent, but we did have a very good number of attendees. I think it's probably one of our, our best attended meetings in the last six months, if not the last year. So that um, even though you couldn't see them, there were a lot of other people enjoying enjoying these talks with you. Um, I'd like to thank our speakers, all three of them, Andrew, Mike and Paul. Um, they, they did a fantastic job. If you missed any of it, the, the YouTube videos will be up in a week or two, certainly before the next meeting in May. And um, yeah, thank you very much. Do, do let me know if you have any feedback. Um, and see you all next month.